let's move on. So let me grab this keyboard and see if it'll reach. It's a lot easier than leaning over. First thing we need to look at is, is what we mean by pressure. Um, you'll all have a more or less <coughs> sensible view of what pressure is anyway. Uh, it's a fairly common everyday thing and a lot of you will have come across pressure in a more technical sense before now anyway I just need to be absolutely certain that we're all going to be using the same words to mean the same things so the first thing we need to think about is is what states of matter we're concerned with we're concerned with fluids and a fluid is either a liquid or a gas it's anything that can flow basically is a fluid um, most of what we will be talking about in this part will actually be liquids so we're going to be looking at fluids that aren't very easy to compress basically uh, that's the distinction but you know as I say we'll be moving on to gases uh, later on uh, next week or the week after um, so the first thing we need to think about is what is pressure well pressure is just defined as force per unit area uh, but the key thing here is to to keep in mind is that the force we're thinking about is a force that is normal to the surface and that simply means that it's at right angles to a surface okay so what you may find you need to do unlikely in any of the problems that I will set but at some stage in the future you may need to uh, use a little bit of trigonometry to go from whatever angle the force is being applied at to the surface <coughs> to the component of that force that is perpendicular okay so force per unit area is pressure um, and the units of pressure are the Pascal uh, and the Pascal is one Newton per square meter right Newton being the force square meters <coughs> obviously representing the area okay so that's our definition um, we can play around a little bit in terms of, of some, well, for want of a better <laughs> word, some thought experiments on this. If we've got a system <coughs> set up like this, uh, so, um, you know, one tank of whatever the liquid is, we can say water if you like, it doesn't really matter, uh, connected through to another one via a valve. Um, and we've got some you know heights and so on there as well um, <coughs> the pressure on this side of the valve is going to be greater than the pressure on that side of the valve quite simply because uh, there is a greater um, uh, height on that side all right we're going to develop that a little bit as we get down towards the bottom of the screen so if we open this valve what we're going to find is that the level here drops, the level here rises, and eventually they will end up at some final level, which will be the same one side or another. This is not a difficult thought experiment. All right? You could have predicted that this will be the result before we even started today's lecture, I'm sure. Um, but you know, let's have a look at this in a little bit more uh, quantitative fashion. Um, so go back to the beginning again, as it is pictured on the slide here, valve closed. Um, we need to calculate what the pressure is on this side of the valve okay um, and the pressure over here is going to be uh, generated by essentially the weight of water so mass times acceleration due to gravity right that's what's going to be pushing down on this side so we've got a mass of water here uh, as it says on the slide uh, which will designate, designate as M and that obviously is just going to be the volume uh, times the density well the volume is the area of this container multiplied by its height All right so A times H is the volume we're going to write use the usual symbol for um, density of, of rho the Greek letter rho okay. um, so the weight of water then is going to be given by mg equals volume so area times height uh, times the density so that gives us the mass of the water times g acceleration due to gravity all right but pressure remember is force per unit area um, so we take out uh, um, um, 
we're going to take out the A and we're left with height times density times G. Okay, so the pressure down here on this side of the valve uh, is related to the height of the column multiplied by the density of the liquid multiplied <coughs> by, by G. <coughs> okay, so these two things we can think of, rho and G, we can think of in this case as constants, and it's the height that's varying. And the same would be true on this side, all right? It would just be uh, the height, whatever the height on this side is, multiplied by rho, multiplied by G. Well, rho and G are the same, both sides. It's the same fluid. So if we open this valve, we have to get to the case where the pressure on both sides is equal. Otherwise, there's going to be a flow of fluid, all right? So we have to end up with uh, the heights on both sides being the same not the volume, not the mass of fluid involved on both sides, because the mass, the volume is going to be greater here than it is here, but the height, that's what's going to determine the pressure, and it's the pressure that has to be equalised when we open the valve. And this is all predicated on the fact that we're looking at a liquid here which is not compressible, right? as I said earlier. Right? It's not the case that we can change volumes by squashing the material. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail uh, later on. So, ways of measuring it. Um, this is a very crude form of manometer. There are some much more sophisticated ones around, but just to illustrate the principle, uh, we can actually measure... Um, uh, I mean, this is supposed to indicate that it's connected to some gas supply here, so we're measuring the pressure of the gas, whatever it might be. But essentially all we need to worry about is the difference in height between these two levels, because that's now determining the difference in pressure on this side compared to this side. Right? <coughs> so, you know, if we disconnected that, if both of these sides were open to atmosphere, the levels would be the same. There's no valve in this system at all. But because we've got a greater gas pressure this side, uh, it's forcing the liquid down by this amount. Right? So the pressure of the gas uh, in this case is H times rho, the density of whatever is in this <coughs> tube, uh, times G, right? plus whatever atmospheric pressure is at this point up here. Right? So H times rho times G is the additional pressure being created by this gas supply on this side. Yeah? So, um, in this example, what would be, what H would we be taking in the context of H? It's, it's the one labelled on here, look. So it's the difference in the height of these columns. Right? If, if H was zero, there's no pressure <coughs> difference. So it is simply how much pressure is, is able to force that height difference between the two. Uh, so what have we done? We've done everything except determine what atmospheric pressure is. Right? The pressure of the gas supply was H times rho times G plus atmospheric pressure acting in this open part of the tube over here. So <coughs> the next thing we have to do is measure atmospheric pressure and uh, again, uh, in this most basic form, the barometer is what you would use to, to measure that. Um, and typically you know, in the past it was mercury, this sort of whatever it is, strawberry pink colour on the screen, um, uh, would be mercury. Okay, so you fill the tube up completely with mercury, you <coughs> tip it over into a mercury reservoir, uh, and the height here is a measure of atmospheric pressure which is acting on these bits on the outside here, right, keeping the fluid up. What's left up in there, of course, is just a vacuum. Atmospheric pressure cannot keep the column of mercury any further up than that. So if we know the density of mercury and we can measure that height, then we can measure what is atmospheric pressure, what's acting down on this surface, external surface of the mercury here. Um, and the standard uh, atmospheric pressure, so the benchmark, uh, is 101 uh, pascals, and that will give you uh, a height of a column here, which is 0.76 meter. All right, so you should be able to do the calculation now and make sure that this is the correct figure. 
All right, if this is 0.76 of a meter and I tell you that the density of mercury is 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter, then you've got G as 9.81 meters per second per second. You've got rho, 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter, and you've got H, 0.76 of a meter. Multiply all those together and you should get 101,000 pascals. Is it correct? Good. Thank you for trying it. Um, so that's where all this, it, it, it is at least self-consistent. That's where it comes from. Okay? So this is our very quick run through of what pressure is. Its first application comes in something called Archimedes <coughs> principle, which again, you may well have come across before. Um, this is the, uh, the story that well, apocryphal story that has Archimedes jumping out of his bath and shouting Eureka. Um, but it's a way of measuring the upthrust on a body. So this is what keeps ships afloat. This is what determines depths that submarines uh, travel at, etc., etc. Okay? Um, and it's a very straightforward approach. All we really have to do uh, is to look at the force acting on the top of this whatever the object is. We're going to make it a cylinder just because the maths is simplest. You can make it any shape you like. Um, but if we look at the force acting on the top, which is trying to push the object down, and we look at the force exerted on the bottom, which is obviously trying to push the object up, and we take the difference between those two, then we've got the net force. Right? It's either a force pushing it up or it's a force pushing it down, whatever that might be. And what we'll find is um, that the upthrust, positive or negative, the upthrust is going to be determined by the, um, uh, the weight of the water that's been displaced by that shape. Right? And that was Archimedes' uh, fantastic discovery. So this is, a, this is a standard, or was a standard way, actually still is a standard way for measuring um, the density of materials. Right? You have a full container of fluid, you drop something in it, you measure the amount of fluid that gets displaced, measure its weight, mg, um, and that will tell you, given that you can measure the mass of the object before you dunk it in there anyway, that now tells you what its density must be. Right? Um, and in fact, we still do it. In my research lab, we've got a piece of kit that uses Archimedes principle. It doesn't use water anymore or liquids. We actually do it with helium gas, uh, which is really very useful because we do a lot of work on porous materials. And you can imagine if you've got micropores uh, um, measuring the density of a material like that could be rather tricky if your fluid doesn't actually get <coughs> access to all of those pores because they're too small for water molecules to go in, for instance. Or the material is hydrophobic, so it tends to keep the water out. Uh, then you have a real problem. So actually, for our fluid, when we're doing this to really quite high precision, uh, we'll use, uh, as our fluid, we'll use helium instead of water or oil or whatever else it might be. Anyway, let's work through this uh, example. Um, we need, as I say, to work out uh, the force that's acting top and bottom. So we're going to start by working, uh, working on the pressure, because uh, we've got an equation for pressure already. It's the height of the fluid uh, above the surface multiplied by the fluid density multiplied by G, right? H rho G, we've already got that. So if we look at this top surface, which is uh, a depth H2, so the column of fluid, water, whatever it is above, um, has a height of, of, of H2, then uh, the pressure on that face is H2 times rho times G. Um, and similarly, the <coughs> pressure acting on the bottom is H1 times rho times G. Yeah? <coughs> So the net, uh, um, we can convert pressure to <coughs> force just by introducing the area. Right? Pressure was just force per unit area. So if we want the force, we just multiply the, the pressure by area. 
and that's one of the reasons for keeping this nice and simple as a shape um, although it's perfectly general so if we want the force then we've got two forces one is at the bottom of the cylinder h1 times rho times g that's the pressure multiplied by the area of that face of the cylinder um, and at the top it's just h2 times rho times g that was the pressure at the top again multiplied by the area it's the same <coughs> area because it's a cylinder <coughs> in this case so if we want to look at the net force we've got to subtract one from the other right? which is the next line down here and as you can see there are some <coughs> common factors here in fact there's a lot of common factors the area of density and g are all common uh, the only things that are different are obviously the heights all right but remember the volume of the cylinder is just h1 minus h2 multiplied by the area it's the height of the cylinder multiplied by its area so this first bit is volume and here we've got volume times density volume times density is just mass yeah so we've actually got the mass of the equivalent amount of water <coughs> to that volume multiplied by g All right, hence the opening statement the net up thrust on this cylinder is the weight mg of the water or whatever fluid it is that's being displaced ok so this is Archimedes principle um, <coughs> now shall I set you a tricky problem you look like you need to be woken up let's spend five minutes doing this alright, imagine sitting in the middle of, I don't know what you, perfectly smooth lake, swimming pool whatever you choose to envisage this as being in a rowing boat with a battery powered TV or whatever it might be alright so <coughs> everything is perfectly still and calm, there is a particular level uh, of water in the pond, the pool, whatever it is you're in. <coughs> All right. So now, clumsy person that you are, the TV and battery go overboard. All right, and they sink. These are not things that generally float. All right. So now, give me the rational argument that tells me whether the level of water in the pool rises or falls or stays the same um, it would stay the same because although the TV as it falls through water will displace water on its own that displacement, the displacement of the boat will be reduced by the same weight because the boat will be less displaced if the TV is no longer in it um, and the TV will displace it separately so you have a summation instead of one single total that's, that's a perfectly rational view of it. It's, it's, it's not right, but it's the perfect, <laughs> perfectly rational view. That, I mean, it was a really good attempt and, and well thought through. Um, let's think what we've done. We've taken something that's more dense than water, dropped it in, and it's sunk. All right? So, ignoring what happens to the boat just for the moment, naively you'd think the level of water in the pond has gone up. Yes? Because we've added some volume to it. Critically, though, we've added the volume of the battery and the TV. Yes? Agreed? Okay. Now, the boat, however, is floating. So the boat is displacing how much mass of water? Going back to Archimedes' principle. It's displacing an amount. All right, it's 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 the displacement. What is under the water is the mass. We can think about the mass of the water being displaced. Yeah, if I put it that way. Right. And that's associated with whatever weight is in the boat. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we've reduced the weight of the boat by battery plus TV right so now we dis the boat now displaces less weight of water right because it's risen exactly as you 
as you said. Yes? Right. But we've reduced the mass of the boat, which means that the amount of water we displace is actually related to the lost mass now in throwing stuff over. Right, so if the boat lifts, that implies that the level of the water would go down. Go down right? So the level of water has gone down according to the, um, <coughs> the reduced mass of the boat. But the water level has gone up because of the volume well, of the objects that have sunk. Well, you, you can, because if these things have sunk, they're obviously more dense than water. Right? So actually, there is a net drop in the level of the pond. Right? There is an effect that causes <coughs> it to rise, but that's associated with the volume of the stuff that you dropped in the water. The boat has actually gone up such that the levels drop more than that because these objects were displacing their own weight of water when they were in the boat. <coughs> yeah? Think about it. <laughs> if you come in tomorrow morning with damp towels wrapped around your head, I will know that we need to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, go away and think about it. Talk about it. Um, it is just Archimedes' principle that we're talking about here. All right? Right, moving on. Um, again, this is just basic pressures and forces. Okay, so this is this is hydrostatics. So we're looking at, you know, car braking systems, um, <coughs> you know, lifts, presses, jacks, anything that works on the basis of hydraulics, uh, essentially. Um, and it's a fairly straightforward, I think, progression, logical progression through. So we've got two cylinders, very similar to the sort of experiment that we did earlier. Uh, so there's a cylinder of high area, a cylinder of low area on this side, and they are connected by a fluid, which again we're going to assume is a liquid, so it's not compressible. Yeah? Um, so the total volume of fluid is going to stay the same. That's essentially what I'm saying. Uh, its density isn't going to change. <coughs> now the difference now is that these surfaces aren't open. We've actually put, we've made these things to be um, um, cylinders. You know, imagine them as hypodermic syringes, whatever you, uh, whatever you like. Um, so this cylinder has a, a cross-sectional area of A1. This one has a cross-sectional area of A2. And we're going to imagine that we're applying a force up here and we're measuring the resultant force over here. All right? So we push down on that one. This fluid is not compressible, so whatever volume of fluid leaves this cylinder has to enter this one. Right? Which means there's a force pushing this plunger upwards. Yeah? So that's the process that we're looking at here. Um, and we can relate force two and force one because we've got no change of, of volume as we're going through, all right? And that that's follows in this, in this way, all right? Force two is just the pressure as exerted here multiplied by the area of that cylinder, all right? So it's <coughs> pressure times A2, all right? But because this is a system connected by uncompressible liquid, uh, that pressure is exactly the same as the pressure over here. Right? This is not now open. This is not <coughs> just a, a difference in height uh, because of some you know, uh, um, changes in atmospheric pressure or whatever. We're actually doing <coughs> something here. We're pushing down on this side. So it's a, an artificial setup in that sense. So we can replace um, pressure from this side with what we know about pressure from this side, which is just force per area. All right, so it's F1 multiplied by uh, A1. So our force over here, force 2, is equal to force 1 
multiplied by A2 over A1. All right, if we rearrange that slightly. Yeah? A2 is greater than A1. So what this is telling us is that whatever force is coming out here is greater than the force that we're putting in on that side. This is the whole basis of hydraulics. We put in a force on this side, we get a greater force out the bigger cylinder the other side, right? This is the bit that sits in the wheel of your car operating the brake pads. This is the brake pedal or the effect <coughs> of the brake pedal. Right, so we put a force in on a small cylinder at one end of the system, we get a much bigger force coming out of the fatter cylinder, the bigger area cylinder at the other side. Precisely how your car brakes work. Yeah? I'm leaving out servo assistance and all these other complicated things, right? The classic braking systems. Now, that seems contrary to physical intuition if we just leave it there. Because that sounds like you're getting something for nothing. Right? There is a payback to this. And the payback is that you will have to move this down by much greater distance to get a smaller displacement on this side. Right? So if we look at this in terms of energy, which is where physicists always end up, right? and energy is just force times the distance over which it's applied. So F1 times whatever distance we push that plunger in is exactly the same as F2 times whatever distance that cylinder moves. Okay, and the, the logic for that is followed through at the bottom of the screen there. Okay, so it's not that we've got something for nothing. Energy is conserved on both <coughs> sides of the, of the system. We've applied a small force but over a bigger distance to get a bigger force over a much smaller distance out the other side. Yeah? Okay. <coughs>